And so, as you can see from the projected figure on the screen, it may be possible one day to go from one end of the universe to the other, though it may take a rather long time to cross it, the upright reptilian professor chuckled. In terms of stellar distances of so the size of the universe, is roughly 420,000 light years across, spinning around a central point. The universe is the extended accretion disk of a massive black hole known simply as the One. Much like how our moons spin around our planet, and our planet spins around the sun. As above, so below. The universe is a massive eclipse of influence as we spin in the void with nothing outside of it, but the universe is a place of boundless possibilities. The bell rang and over the almost instant sound of shuffling packs, feet and papers, he raised his voice. Homework will be to read chapters 4 and 5 about the state and current theories of the creation of the universe. There will be a quiz on both chapters next class. See you then. He smiled cheerfully as the students started to talk with a few overheard groans as the class made their way out of the lecture hall. After ensuring there were no students that needed his attention after class, he packed up his notes and logged out of the computer before heading down the hall towards his office. The astrophysics department was well funded at the university and he had a private office that he made his way towards to go over some of his research. The photos he asked for from the observatory should have been processed and ready on his desk by now. Perhaps he would load them onto his tablet and look at them over lunch outside and answer a few emails for a while until his office hours later that day. He thought he noted one of the science channels asking for an interview again before he logged out in the lecture hall. It was good to have tenure. This is the perfect academic life, he thought to himself. Reaching the department, he pulled his keys out of his bag, slotted them into the door and opened it to perhaps the last sight he had ever expected and that would shatter his idyllic academic path. Sitting at his desk in front of him as he opened the door, relaxing in his high back seat, was an alien. It was the stereotypical one for his species that they all knew about from bad movies 30 years ago, which he incidentally grew up watching. Two arms and two legs in a familiar arrangement, but no tail. A tan-skinned, furless, upright mammal, with a tuft of fine hair on its, his, head, in fine-fitting clothes of an unknown material. Nose protruding from an ugly squashed face in place of a snout, and a pair of forward-facing eyes that glowed a faint Cherekhanov blue from within, as they regarded the professor intelligently while he was frozen in the doorway. Ah, professor, come on in. You've come just in time for my own office hours, the alien says pleasantly, as the professor drops his keys and bag numbly to the floor, and stupidly looks at the door again to read his own name there on the nameplate. Confirming that, yes, he somehow didn't get the wrong office, as his brain desperately attempted to rationalise this impossibility in front of him. The alien looked at him with what must be a touch of concern. You're alright, Professor. Why don't you have a seat? Deciding that has at least some merit to it, he moved into the office and dropped into one of the seats in front of his desk his students use. I've lost it. That's right, I must be having a stroke, the Professor said weakly as the door closed behind him, quietly, on his own volition. Hardly, the alien smiled wily, without showing any teeth. You are wrong about a great many things, my Silurian friend, but you are not crazy, or having a stroke. The professor finally looked up and eyed the alien with incredulity. Then what in all that is sacred is a B-movie alien doing in my office at my desk? Oh, that? He waved his hand nonchalantly. You're utterly wrong about the nature of the universe. It's not your fault, of course, but if there's one thing we as a species just for some reason can't stand, it's people being wrong on the internet or TV. So why and the rest of my species are here to drop some knowledge on you? The professor blinked. What? He says, with deadpan disbelief. The alien laughed jovially. Okay, perhaps a little preface is in order. Question is where to start. It nodded after a moment. Okay. A man of your intelligence must have started to notice some of the cracks in your current models and theories. Star formation rates are not what they should be for a perpetual universe. You've noticed odd redshift readings on your universe, he air quotes, indicating it might be shrinking closer together, and your most advanced models refuse to cooperate with observed data. You're hoping for some insight, and you and your fellows here will be able to patch your elegant models that will let you account for these seemingly minor issues. Sound about right? he asked. The professor frowns, but nodded, wondering where the alien with glowing eyes was going with this. The problem is you are not playing with a full deck. You have blinders on and don't even know it, 
and your models will have to nearly be thrown out. The professor snorts. Are you saying we lack some sense that you innately have, and that will bar us from the mysteries of the universe? He asked, privately wondering what the hell he was doing debating an alien being in his office. No, I'm not saying that at all. The problem here is time. Time? Time. You and your species unfortunately were born and evolved too late. You never got to see the real sky. He sounded wistful, and this sparked the professor's curiosity. So, let's go back to the beginning. The very beginning. Imagine, if you will, all the energy, matter and energy that will become matter in the universe condensed into a single point. A singularity in the true void. A pinprick of light shines between the pair of them over the desk. It, containing all the energy and stuff of the cosmos, very much does not like to be compressed into an infinite point and explodes violently and rapidly. The stuff inside this rapidly expanding bubble is our universe. A blinding bubble of light expanded over the desk and engulfed the two, leaving them in swirling semi-darkness as the professor starts at the sudden silent holographic explosion, and the alien continued. And it keeps expanding. Something about the way his guest said that made the professor take note. We call this event the Big Bang. I won't get into how they occur or how to make one, because it's not important right now and frankly dangerous knowledge to have so early in a civilization's development. The professor looked like he wanted to object and go on a tangent, but the alien quickly continued his lecture. However, it's important to note that when the universe was just born and expanding, it didn't do so evenly. Fluctuations in the quantum foam of the early universe made a couple of areas slightly denser than others. When it expanded in what we call cosmic inflation, the subatomic rapidly became the cosmic in fractions of a fraction of a second. After a bit, Gravity got hold of those slightly denser clusters. Care to guess what happened next, Professor? He asks. Star formation, he said, after a moment's thought, and the alien smiled again. Correct, although you are still not thinking grand enough, I think. I'm guessing you keep trying to run this against your current paradigm. You're the one being the remnants of the Big Bang or similar. But I'm talking massive short-lived stars, that would become the supermassive black holes like your most singularity at the centre of your universe. Those that would and will reside the centres of it and other galaxies and would make the stuff that would form heavy elements and become other stars and planets when they went nova or collapsed and become protogalactic groups and superclusters. The professor blinked at the unfamiliar word and the thought, trying to wrap his head around it while the alien nodded. That's right. What you think of as the static and unchanging universe is actually just one of the innumerable others like it in the same, uh, plane. Stellar formations we call galaxies. Then why have we never seen any evidence of those other so-called galaxies? He countered. The alien sighed sadly. Again, time, and the weakness of gravity. While gravity was victorious in the more dense regions of space, outside of those pockets, the universe continues to expand a rate greater than the speed of light. Inside the dense pockets, what we call local groups, all the matter in there continues to come together to form a single galaxy at the center of each local group. Outside that pocket, you continue to be flung away from other galaxies and galactic groups. Something clicked for the professor. You said the universe kept expanding. Does that mean the other dense pockets have gone beyond the light envelope that we can detect from our pocket? The alien grinned and nodded. Very good, yes. Expanding and accelerating. Many of your models fail because you are missing expansion rates and dark energy constants, and without them your civilization more than likely will never produce viable FDL. You are missing answers to questions you never knew you had to ask, because the evidence to support asking them in the first place is beyond your line of sight. Even cosmic background radiation has faded below the output of your star. You never get any kind of inkling of the Big Bang's occurrence until well, well outside the heliopause. The professor frowned as the hologram with no visible source played out around him, providing visuals to the alien's words. What it said made sense. A lot of sense. And the alien seemed an expert and its possession of an FTO device seemed a given. If all this was true and he wasn't hallucinating. But the thought of it filled the professor with an odd existential dread then the universe was actually larger, far beyond his comprehension, and a kind of melancholy that they would never have figured out how to give the universe speed limit the middle claw without help, simply for evolving late in the cosmic scheme of things. I assume you can back this all up? He asked, 
as he attempted to give himself more processing time or come up with a counter-argument. The alien nodded, and with a snap of his fingers, 30 stacks of paper, anywhere from 2 to 4 feet high, appeared all around the office with a solid thump. I know this is a lot to take in. He gestures around at the papers covering almost every surface. This is the fill-in-the-gaps version to update many of your current formulas and theories. You and your academic descendants will have to try and fill in the rest of the resulting questions yourself over time. The professor looked around in wonder a moment before he scowled. You couldn't have sent an email with attachment? <laughs> more fun this way, the alien said cheerfully. As for more proof... The office ceiling changed as if the roof dissolved to reveal a night sky filled with alien constellations and twinkling stars. So many that it stole the professor's breath for a moment. This is the view from our planet when we were roughly at your current level of technological development. The view slowly started to zoom in on a dim patch of sky until it revealed distant pinpricks that resolved into myriad galaxies, several looking just like their current understanding of what was up until recently their entire universe. When we first looked up and out on the night, there were two trillion galaxies that we could see, each with at least 100 to 400 billion stars. Space is big, unfathomably big, and getting bigger. When was this taken? The professor asked with awe. The alien gave a wiry smile again. We are older than your star, and when this was taken, there were still two main galaxies in this local group before they merged. We are old, unfathomably old, and getting older. The professor looked at the alien, questions piling up with questions in his mind, but instead he blurted out, Why? Why help us like this? Every species deserves the opportunity to reach for the stars and explore them, professor. To perhaps meet their fellow explorers. It's not your fault you came so late to the scene, he says with utmost sincerity. He then gives a toothy grin. Besides, if our experiment works and we reverse the inflation acceleration, you'll need some context for what's going on when other galaxies start to appear back in the sky. Wait, what? And the alien was gone, leaving the professor in his seat, surrounded by reams of paper, looking wide-eyed in disbelief at an empty chair.